So today, throughout the day, um, we'd really e extra specially like you to jump in and ask questions and prompt where we're going. Uh, we have a s couple of topics this morning. The first one sort of focusing a little bit more on our code base, uh, but we recognize there's a great diversity of uh, experience and skills out there. So uh, we really do want you to chime in and, and ask those questions that that you're curious about throughout the day today. Um, the first session that we have, we wanted to open it up and sort of focus a little bit more on that developer development side of Taxon Works. We did wanted to start to say that we consider a lot of our team developers, right? There's a lot of different roles. Just because you write code, um, or, sorry, just because you don't write code doesn't mean you're not part of a development team. Um, that said, I would like to start with a couple of quick questions in the chat. Um, if you can put a plus one, if in the past year you have written some code. So if you have written some code in the past year, year please add a plus one in chat. Okay, excellent. That's great to see people writing a lot of code. Okay. Um, so the next question, you can keep adding plus one if you've written code in the last year. The next code, the question is a plus two if you would like to write code. If you perhaps didn't, but you would like to be writing code. It's really excellent. It shows a lot of great potential, and I think there's a really good intersection here. Thank you, everyone, for sharing uh, with sort of TaxonWorks philosophy. So we'll try to cover that. And to wrap up a plus three, if they see the need for code in their work. Do you, do you have a workflow that requires code or you can see whether or not you're coding in it, does your workflow, your day-to-day -day issues, regardless if you're an administrator or a researcher or a developer, do you see the need for code? And I'm hoping that many people could answer that. All right, thanks for sharing there. Uh, that's a great start. I've got one slide with many links for this morning. The basic idea is that we're going to um, we're going to start off by pointing out some of the resources around Taxon Works as we think of it as a code base um, to start off with. Right about in the middle, we're going to have Dima Mozarin give us a bit more of a of a um, meta conversation or a thought experiment. He's going to talk about an exchange format that we're talking about and thinking about here at the species file group and then we'll wrap it up with some more questions but i want to start off with really opening the table i know a couple of you had excellent questions in the last two days about our code base um, katie asked for example how do you guys accept code how do you know you know contributions that are coming out coming to you how do you know you should accept the code so I want to point out that our first resource that is available to you when you're thinking about our code base, when you're thinking about our development model, is us right here, right now. So I'd like to encourage you or open the floor to ask questions that you may have. Anything goes about um, the development strategies, uh, our documentation, our larger thought process about how we build Taxon Works, uh, the code we use, the languages we use. Do you have questions? If so, start us off. And ideally, we spend a fair bit of time just answering those questions rather than me just bouncing around and showing you uh, some of the resources that we have. So are there questions? Feel free to raise your hands, ask in chat, and we'll leave it open for a minute or two to just see where this takes us. Nikki notes right off the bat, uh, do you mean like GitHub tickets and writing a good issue report as a valuable as a valuable as a skill in coding, properly responding to issue tickets is a critical skill for software developments. Yeah, thank you, Nikki, for pointing that out, that, that we really depend on our community as a series of collaborators to communicate with us when they want a new feature or when they find a bug, et cetera. So one of the things that we can do is help our users understand that there are, you know, a whole pile of open open issues here. Here you see our TaxonWorks, one of our TaxonWorks issue tracker, trackers. There are some others. 
there's 772 issues. And when you've come in, we ask you to tell a story so that we can resolve um, what the issue is. When you click on new issue here, oops, I'm gonna, I should have done this on my other browser. Uh, I'm just gonna pivot here, share my other browser quick. Hold on, where's my Zoom links? Show you what that looks like quickly. So when you, um, when you hit the issue tracker and you click new issue on GitHub, what Nikki is alluding to is that um, we have a bunch of templates that can help, or you can tell your own start story. But when you open a bug report, we ask you to do things like add a title to the bug and how do you reprodu reproduce the bug, providing a screenshot for the bug, um, talking about, you know, what did you experience and what did you expect to experience, etc. And so tell us where you hit this. Was this in the sandbox or the production environment? These are all different things here. So learning as a skill how to fill bugs, bugs, bug reports or issue uh, feature requests is exactly part of that development environment. Knowing that it's really useful to search through and find issues that already exist. So for example, I can see this new issue that came up from uh, Adriano about the WWF, but I know that because I spent a lot of time on this, that there's actually a second issue. So here I've searched for WWF and I can see that one of the very first issues suggested this same thing. So this is a duplicate issue, right? So knowing that and trying to find that issue and then learning that you can plus one this issue, right? In fact, Adriano already suggested this, um, way back um, is a way to keep our issues down and to sort of join the conversation and be aware of our broader conversation. So that's a nice introduction of the fact that it's not all just about coding. Other questions or observations? Yeah, I'd like to add briefly, it's, it fits in with this notion, and we saw some of that yesterday, the sort of send an email to kind of conversation. And the difference of a well done GitHub ticket compared to sending an email. So in our community, it has been the longstanding practice for, for lots of practical reasons that when someone finds an issue, there's often a, a link to, oh, this is the technical contact and an email. This, this results in the only sort of two people in the world that know about the issue are you who found it and the person who received your email in a sense. Right. So we try to encourage and support our community moving toward using issue trackers. And we've had some success, we're happy to say, uh, with getting away from someone sending us uh, somebody like myself or Matt or somebody else on our team, a long email with all the different issues all sort of lumped into one giant email where it's very difficult to move forward with those and to track their progress. So we move them into issue trackers and it's been exciting to see uh, them adopt that and realize that email has limitations for dealing with that kind of, uh, or, or doing it well. And it's not transparent, right? Mm -hmm. Dealing Using the issue trackers becomes transparent and more of us can contribute to um, going forward with whatever the issues are that are posted. Yeah, thanks Debbie. So I'm, I'm gonna watch in the chat here. Let's give it another second or two and other questions that wanna guide us there or observations or hands up. Is there some specific thing you wanna know about why we do things the way we do them? Yeah, thanks, Jill. That's a great question. What's an API? Wonderful. So an API is an application programming interface it's essentially a set of rules. I'm just gonna try to figure out a definition off the top of my head. So please also in the chat, chime in. It's a set of rules that say, if you give us this input, you can expect this output. So in TaxonWorks, um, you can come and one of the APIs is our JSON serving API that we expose data in your TaxonWorks project to. But there's lots of other APIs, a very generic term. 
Um, another API could be, for example, and I'll show you a bit more about what those are, um, the documentation that is in here in any one of our models. This is our taxon name model, for example. And here I have comments or documentation about the attributes in that model. This is the name field and the parent ID field and the year of publication. So knowing that I can um, use a taxon name object in TaxonWorks, I would want to know how can I interact with that object or that bit of code. And these are ways that I can interact with those. So those are somewhat of the API. We often use API as a way to describe the JSON serving part of it, how we get data out. So I'll give you a quick example here. If we go to um, sfg.taxonworks.org slash API slash v1, this is a request to um, a certain endpoint, a certain bit of code. And that certain bit of code takes this request. It says, show me what you know at the base. And it gives me a response. And it's a formatted response. This is called JSON, um, JavaScript serial object notation, but that doesn't really matter. Everybody just thinks of JSON as its own thing. And it gives us an array of sort of data, a list of data. Think of this as a table and each with like many rows with many little different cells here, perhaps. Um, yeah, thanks, Nikki. That's a wonderful hardware uh, metaphor, right? Um, so when you have a box and maybe you have a tuner, right? But your tuner doesn't have an amplifier. And then your amplifier um, doesn't have any um, CD playing capabilities. So you have a CD player. That's one of these metal disc things for the kids out there that you, you know, put into a device that records music. Um, and maybe you need to have an MP3 player to plug it in. So each of those boxes has little inputs and the wires connect them out. So the, the, the inputs on those boxes are sort of your API uh, interfaces and the information goes through, you know, as electrical current from box to box to box. And one of the things we do in TaxonWorks is we try to, um, it's called dog fooding. We try to dog food our own API. So when we create a interface, um, we need to be able to get the data out of that to display it in a sort of public frame or in, in a user interactable way. Let me show you a quick example. If I go to um, the insect collection, you're seeing an interface here, but behind the scenes, we're making a whole bunch of calls to our API, our internal API. So let's see here. If I go to filter OTUs and I draw a little map um, here, you know, to the user, you're just sort of seeing interactions with the interface. Um, behind the scenes, if I do this, you can see that there's actually a bunch of network requests. This is the debugger in Firefox that I've pulled up. And there's a whole bunch of things going back and forth to the server, right? Um, let's see if I can actually make a, a request. Where am I here? That gets as a result. So as I did that, you saw this little thing tick up and it's sending results to the um, um, street map server, etc. Why am I not getting anything? I don't understand. Uh, let's do something else. Let's just do filter. And then let's select this and send those to collecting events. So here I've made a request for collecting events. Um, behind the scenes, we can see that there's actually this, this request to the to what we you know one of the APIs in TaxonWorks, uh, that's a long one. Let's see if I can get it in there. If I paste that out, oh, it didn't get the whole thing. I made it too long. Let me see if I can backpedal. Make it a bit shorter. Uh, I'm missing some spacing. Sorry. Let's do it this way. I need a shorter request. Um, you're watching me scramble to the text editor. All right, let's see if this does it. Yeah, so behind the scenes, this table of data that you saw pulled up is coming at us in this format right here. 
So anything that you can do there, um, anything that you can do in the interface, you should be able to get this technical bit of data back behind the scenes. What the important part of it is for all of you who said you'd like to code, and there's some great examples, is that you can see these kind of values that you might want to be putting into your own Excel sheet or building your own report. And TechCentWorks lets you do that, right? Like you can get this outside of the interfaces through the API uh, that we documented here in api.taxonworks.org. Yeah, okay, thanks, Jill, for leading that. Um, just to show a couple other you know, resources, obviously there's the code base itself here that's all open source. Um, there's a documentation, there's a bunch of different documentation levels. So if you're looking to join and make contributions to the code base, when you come to docs.taxonworks.org, there's two major sections. One is to the guide, and that's sort of using the user interface and everything else. And of course, the other one is developing. So there's a lot of resources there. Um, you can get down, we automatically generate doc, um, our doc documentation. Let's see, I've got the wrong link. Um, for all of our code. So when we add comments to our code, that's translated and it goes into rdoc.taxonworks.org. So here, this is another way of thinking about an API. All of these different models here that go on and on and on are can be interacted with, right? And this rdoc sort of describes that API at that level. We do a lot of commenting in code. So at least at minimum, if you want to know what the field definitions are, if you're exploring TaxonWorks, you can come to the app models section. So we follow a certain convention. Here's the app folder. And then you can click on any of the models here. I like showing you the taxon name again. And here are all the fields. And we try to do our best to actually comment in and provide a definition for how that field is adding semantics to our overall approach. So that's there and there's documentation there. There's also a little bit of meta. Um, there's a lot of talk nowadays about how your repositories and code should look, right? And there was a really nice blog post I'll share here in a second. But throughout the TaxonWorks code base, you'll see some of these readme files and these are evolving. You're also gonna start to see these other files called architecture files. And they sort of, they, they sort of explain what we expect to see in code in these folders and files or how you should arrange your method names how you should code those out so these are resources um, that help us come to a sort of common way of doing things in the code base um, there's a really neat um, concept that or a really neat article that came out just this week uh, really serendipitously from thoughtbot this is a pretty famous company that also builds applications like TaxonWorks. So they build Rails applications. They call that Ruby Science. And it's a book and it talks about like how to catch problems. Like how do you catch that there may be issues in your application? What can you do to be aware of writing maintainable code? And how can, you know, as you, TaxonWorks code base is over 10 years old, it's gonna drift off in certain directions and kind of forget what it did here or, or, or you know, start doing something differently over there. Um, and so this is a really wonderful summary for a lot of things that we think about when we talk about developing a uh, sort of maintainable code base that lots of people can contribute to. And we can share that link. I'll share it in the chat here. Um, and there's lots of words like code smell, right? Like when you're a developer or somebody that's joining us, how do you know when something is a little bit off in the code base? And I think we've been pretty successful with TaxonWorks in trying to adopt certain conventions, right? Or um, taking a certain approach that uh, allows others to jump in. And again, I'm gonna mention the work, one of the big milestones that we had this year was Tom Klein, who I think is lurking here jumped in and added a whole bunch of code to the to the code base so you can see his, the most recent contribution is this effort to um, make a pull request that will allow us to import nexus files and here I'll, I'll share this as well so you people can explore to see what it looks like here's the conversation and i just want to point out a couple of things which were really wonderfully done just like nikki said, talked about writing a good issue tom has made an amazing um 
pull requests. So this is Tom taking the code and then bringing it back. So Tom has documented a lot of, um, you know, the approach. Uh, there's a nice set of individual, con um, all his commits, all the little individual steps that were taken to produce that code are listed out here. And there's a long ongoing conversation that um, sort of frames the questions that Tom had when uh, building this out. And that lets somebody like Jose or I, who are familiar with the code base and some of the conventions, quickly go in and address things. We can also quickly go in and look at the files changed, right? And say, oh, you know what, Tom, you did it this way, but in our convention, we like to do it this way, right? Maybe we spell out the name. So there are some really wonderful examples, and this was a real milestone for us for taking code that we didn't expect um, to be able to do um, in from an outside collaborator. And this made us feel very good about the general conventions that we have um, with respect to taking in new code. So in the interest of time, I'm going to look for new questions while you're thinking of all of that. And I want to pass it over to Dimitri, Dima. Dima and I and the rest of the species file group have been thinking about um, an intermediate exchange format. So we're going to geek out a little bit here that would help speed up data exchange, not just between um, Taxon Works teams or projects, but between things like global names and Taxon Works. So Dima is going to say a little bit more about how we might be able to add this meta layer or this intermediate layer that kind of a, uh, an accelerator of some sorts. Um, into our workflows. Dima, you take it away for a second. How can we make um, data exchange more frictionless? It's a kind of word that people like to say, uh, to say it in a more uh, human language, uh, how to make data exchange easier between different projects. And uh, uh, one idea that we have is to use uh, not a text format as we usually use, um, like CSV, uh, uh, tab delimited, XML, JSON, uh, Darwin Core, uh, and so on. Um, instead of using text for, uh, text uh, exchange formats, how can we use can we use uh, SQLite instead of that? And uh, please uh, let us know if you have um, feedback ideas. Um, this is. Uh, proof of concept at the moment. Um, when you do uh, data exchange, um, there are two major things. Uh, one is terms. Uh, terms determine a uh, semantic constraint. Like, for example, when you have a term scientific name, it is not reference. You know, it is something about scientific name. Um, and there are exchange, exchange formats that pack these terms into something that is more or less standard. And uh, exchange formats can be very loose, like uh, comma-separated files, uh, or uh, less loose, like Darwin Core um, uh, and uh, XML, JSON, and so on. And uh, uh, what we're thinking uh, that when you use these formats, uh, it is always um, you always have to go through parsing. And uh, for example, uh, when I use um, Darwin Core, uh, it doesn't take me one hour to make a, a Darwin Core parser. It re literally takes me a month or more uh, to make a parser that is satisfied for my purposes. And uh, my purposes are limited. If you do it more than, uh, like, for example, Marcus, he spends a lot of time uh, to make uh, a parsing uh, available for everything that GBF needs. Um, and uh, uh, I think this is a, a problem uh, that we can try to avoid if we use uh, something else. So what is SQLite? Uh, SQLite, I often thought about it like a toy database that is good for small things, but uh, cannot be used for anything serious. Uh, however, it definitely changed lately. Um, for example, SQLite can easily work with the uh, databases uh, that are terabytes of size, uh, and uh, it will not, it doesn't choke on them. Um, uh, funny enough, uh, you already use SQLite today when you open your computer, when you open the browser, 
because every browser has SQLite included. Uh, and actually, because of that, uh, because so many programs use it, uh, it is installed on every phone, it's installed on every computer. And uh, uh, another very interesting thing about it, uh, developers of SQLite um, promised not to change backward compatibility until 2050. So we have 25 years of uh, uh, being uh, sure that uh, when we exchange SQLite file, it will be uh, working on every computer. Um, and because of that, even um, uh, Library of Congress, Congress of USA uh, recommends uh, SQLite as archival format uh, together with JSON with XML, uh, which is uh, like very high uh, trust uh, shown to SQLite format as a stable format. Um, so one good thing about it, that when you create a database, database is just one file, and that makes it very easy to uh, give it to somebody else. Um, it can be, you don't need parser because it is a database. You can query and search this database immediately as soon as you got the file. Um, uh, if you don't want binary, uh, you can dump data into a text-only version. And text uh, only version is highly compressible, very easy to exchange. And uh, every language that is used in biodiversity uh, has a SQLite uh, binding uh, library. So uh, it doesn't matter what language you use, you can use this file uh, in your code. Uh, so the idea that we have, uh, can we use SQLite, uh, can we create a schema which is a database structure pretty much that serves as a uh, exchange format. Uh, in our uh, group, there are three major projects that we participate in. Uh, it is Catalog of Life, Tax and Words, Global Names. And it would be very neat if uh, somebody give uh, information to one of the projects, another project can use it. Or for example, <clears throat> uh, like if you, need to import data to tax and works, you write uh, data into intermediate format. And uh, this format already has a date, uh, already knows how to convert your data into tax and works or into Darwin core or into uh, call DP, which is catalog of life format. So what we are thinking is using SQLite as a universal converter. So we uh, need to write only once importer uh, for each of the uh, of the formats that we care about. And uh, we need to write only once exporter. So as soon as we have exporter to Taxon Works and we get a file into uh, our schema, uh, we already have a converter. We don't need to write it again, which practically uh, saves time. And uh, uh, we can also use semantic versioning, which means, for example, if our schema is stable and we have uh, version one for the schema, uh, everybody who uh, downloaded the file, which contains the version of the uh, schema, they already have uh, scripts that can work with this file without any additional work. Uh, the main problem I would say, say is to design a good schema. We probably cannot make universal one, uh, but uh, we can start small and uh, uh, do it uh, more and more. And uh, as an example, I would not have time to run it, but I will still run it. Uh, so for example, half a million uh, names from uh, index Fangorum take uh, two minutes to convert from Darwin core to a schema uh, and uh, uh, resulting file is uh, 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 can can work directly in a SQLite and query it and so on without any additional uh, work. So that's all. And uh, what you think about this idea would uh, it would be very good to know.
Thanks, Dima. Hopefully that resonated with some of you. I know there's a bunch of people in the audience here that have done a lot of work with moving and merging names back and forth. Um, and we'd love to hear your feedback as we move forward on this. Dima, let us remind me, are, do we have repos on, on this shared already? Uh, yes, we do have a repo. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, I can, I can put it in. Yeah. So for example, uh, here is the schema that we use. Uh, and the uh, index angorum can be uh, queried um, uh, something like this. So we see half million names. Um, and it's it's about as fast as uh, Postgres. Uh, of course, it has its own limitations. But for exchange, these limitations are actually plus than, uh, rather than minus, I think. Very cool. Uh, Fritz nails us with a big question, um, which is really wonderful. Um, we are technically out of time, but we also have um, more more sort of show and tell from the species file group in our next session. So, um, Fritz, I'm going to read you. So, how do you approach taxonomy and taxon works as a data model, considering the complexity of the hierarchical relationships were not all part required? And several parts should be linked. For example, a species belongs to a subfamily, which in turn belongs to a family, but there should be a direct link from the species to the family. Additionally, how extensible is the taxonomic framework, particularly in the context of the phylo code, which uses a hierarchy based or nested clades rather than specific taxonomic levels? So, Fritz, I would love to follow up on that conversation. I'm going to give you the one 30 second answer. Um, we created an ontology behind the scenes called Nomen. We'll post a link to that in a second. And we essentially took Nomen and turned all of the classes in Nomen into code. Um, and we coupled that with a graph relationship. Um, so we have nodes, which are protonyms, and we have relationships between nodes. And then we have attributes on nodes and edges. Um, so a very simple data model with more complicated semantics from that we've essentially mirrored from an ontology. Um, what that allows us to do is compartmentalize the logic that we need to handle different codes of nomenclature. There are some conventions that we take with nomenclature. We treat names as names. And so um, if the Philo code really is trying to relate concepts, then the nomenclatural model doesn't fit. But we would have to have a bigger conversation. This has come up before. Can we model other codes of nomenclature? We currently know we currently model all of the major um, codes, ICZN, ICN, um, et cetera. We 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 try in the no taxon name um, framework to only encode the rules that are governed rules, right? So we try to limit the space about what we're going to say. If we're talking about relationships between biological concepts, that happens with OTU relationships um, and a separate place. So I can't get much further than that, but um, it's a great question. It has come up before and we can follow up on what's going on there. Um, let me think to wrap that up. Okay, um, to wrap that up, while I'm trying to pull another slide here, I guess one of the final questions is, can we get a plus four if you would be interested in participating in a workshop that expands these ideas that gives you some basic um, that gives you some basic uh, training in how to code new features into taxon works we have done precursors in the past where uh, people have come in for a week-long workshop and they've all added features to the code base uh, a precursor code base so it can happen um, we would take you from the basics of getting around the code base to being able to write, you know, API requests, summarizing them, et cetera. So plus four in chat, if you would like to be in a virtual, but maybe even preferable in-person workshop, if that would be of interest, um, or, you know, a kind of classic hackathon, if those of you who are out there have participated in hackathons, um, where sometimes it can be a little bit more in depth, um, but those can be made to, serve a lot of different people. Um, let us know if, if a hackathon that is taxon works 
um, sort of centric or oriented would be of interest to you as you go along. Um, yeah, so the so definitely Dima provided a lot of different um, ideas as well. Somebody noted here that we would like to get feedback on. I, I think in the interest of time, we probably have, yeah, the schema there. Nikki, you had a, a question or comment. Oh, yeah, it depends how much time you have. It's just uh, because you mentioned the hackathon. So I, I was at an interesting hackathon last week, uh, part of the Software Sustainability Institute in the UK. And I was really impressed with the way that they uh, judged the participants in that, the teams in that hackathon. So the judges visited every kind of half day and they posed us teams questions like, how are you resolving conflict among uh, uh, within your team about approach? How are you ensuring that everyone is participating? Things like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And the the winning uh, the winning teams were uh, assessed on that as much as the pitch of the product at the end. And yeah. the idea is that they form that that single day event form teams, which then have a longer life. So I've, I've been at some hackathons where you just go in hell for leather to do your five minute pitch at the end, and then everyone votes on the best one. And that can be that can have been the work of only one person, mm -hmm. you know, and the other people just are sitting around twiddling their thumbs. But these were really emphasizing how to build a team and mm -hmm. how to have longevity after the event. So if you, if you thought about running a hackathon, I'd, I'd, I'd really um, recommend thinking about, uh, yeah, trying not to run it as a single event, but thinking of it as a seed event to 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 bring more people in for the longer term in your project. Certainly would love that idea. I've in the hackathons I've participated at, they haven't been competitions and they've had some Hilmar Lapp has uh, led them and they've had some wonderful concepts, uh, you know, to, to help build teams, etc. So yeah, very specifically, I would love to, to try to frame it just like you said, as um, growing our community around taxon works, getting it, uh, you know, building skill sets, either in small groups or individually that let us write better tickets, that let us request changes in a sort of a more um, educated or focused way, providing, um, you know, a lot of you have seen the tasks in Taxon Works. We have code models that you can start and you can just spin up a task super easy. So once you know a little bit of, of the Taxon Works DSL, you can be writing your whole mini task or app in one single file. Right, and being able to give people the experience to do that and then help them contribute that back is only going to enrich our community. So I completely agree, um, and I think I would not even run it as a competition, but just as a as a way to you know one of the principles is you're either learning or you're you know you're doing something. Um, so you team up and you try to make sure that you're doing uh, you're always active in that sense. 